the search for life on Mars on History's Mysteries. 1984, Antarctica. A six-person team from the National Science Foundation is combing the Allen Hills for meteorites. It was as we were leaving the area that um, I spotted this meteorite. Um, so I called over um, the team and, and we all looked at it. At the time, we had no idea where it was from, what, it, what kind of meteorite it was. It was just, we were gonna pick it up. Although more than 300 meteorites are collected on the expedition, Roberta Score remembers this one meteorite in particular because of its unusual greenish color. Sample ALH84001 is collected and kept frozen until SCORE brings it back to the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. I kept telling my colleagues, oh, wait till you see this green rock, and then when we opened it up, it wasn't green, and so they all kind of laughed at me. But it is SCORE who will have the last laugh. The meteorite is classified as a diogenite, a common meteorite type found between Mars and Jupiter, and it's stored in Houston along with thousands of others. It isn't until nine years later in 1993 that anyone bothers to take a second look at ALH 84001. Dr. David Middlefelt, a geologist at the Johnson Space Center, finds traces of Martian atmosphere in ALH 84001, and now Roberta Scorr's little diogenite is reclassified as the 12th of 12 known Mars meteorites. Just how it got here from there is equally fascinating. The best guess is that it started its trip 16 million years ago when an asteroid-sized meteorite hit Mars. The meteorite hits the ground, and a shockwave goes out from the impact. And that shockwave basically peels back the ground, and some small fraction is peeled back so fast that it can leave Mars because Mars has a low gravity field. So it goes into the orbit around the sun, and then ultimately some of it falls on the Earth. Thousands and thousands of tons of Mars have rained on Earth over the past millions of years. Now Roberta Scores' Martian meteorite gets more attention. In 1994, NASA geologist Dr. David McKay takes a look at Mars meteor number 12 and finds something else, something that will re-energize the foundering life on Mars debate. The Dave McKay group knew that I had been on this expedition, so they came up to me and they started asking me a lot of very strange questions about this rock. And so finally they let me in that they thought that they had some life in this meteorite and they suspected it was from Mars. This was two years before it came out um, to the public. That public announcement happens on August 7th, 1996. We're here today to provide exciting scientific findings that lead us to the direction that we think life might have existed at some point on Mars. My reaction was, I well remember, see it's funny, you go out to dinner and you come back and the Earth has changed, the whole world is different. The McKay Group cites four factors that indicate life. Carbonate globules, magnetite particles that look like they were made by bacteria, objects that resemble fossilized bacteria, and the presence of organic compounds called PAHs. The evidence is compelling, but many scientists argue that it is not proof of life on Mars. It turns out these organic molecules that are called PAHs are uh, very common in other meteorites and they can be readily produced without life being involved. The rock ALH84001 doesn't by itself really prove that life might be more or less abundant outside Earth, but it does confirm all our current thinking that life on ancient Mars is quite a possibility and that if life got started on Mars, it might still have found a way to survive, and perhaps in little underground caverns where liquid water might exist if only temporarily, so that it's really just a stepping stone, no pun intended, on the road to searching for life on other planets and throughout the universe. It's certainly enough to get NASA the money it needs to launch a new billion-dollar Mars program. Mars Global Surveyor takes off just four months after the meteorite press conference and begins sending back new, higher-resolution images. Eight months later, on July 4, 1997, Mars Pathfinder is the first space probe to land on the Red Planet in more than two decades. Sojourner, a six-wheeled miniature rover, captivates a television audience larger than the one that watched the moon landing in 1969. 
that very successful, uh, just absolutely exciting experiment of landing and roving on the surface for the first time. That has led us to feel comfortable that we should plan for aggressive exploration where we return to the surface frequently with small landers. While NASA begins work on a new series of landers, Mars Global Surveyor is still clicking away. In 1998, Global Surveyor returns to Cydonia and re-photographs the face on Mars. When you look at the higher resolution photos, I think that no unbiased observer can see a face. Instead, you see that there are some interesting rock formations that from the right angle might suggest a face. But the new pictures don't change everyone's minds as NASA had hoped. Global Surveyor saw the face illuminated from below, kind of like holding a flashlight under your chin on Halloween, so the image was very distorted geometrically. It looked nothing like the Viking image. Ultimately, the face on Mars is in the eye and mind of the beholder. People are welcome to look them up on the internet and see what these new images look like, and they sure look like a coincidence. It's kind of sad because, uh, you know, in both my scientific work and my fictional work, I love aliens, but you got to have some skepticism, too. We've developed scientific analysis and reasoning to help us with those tricks that our mind is always happy to play on us. And in the case of the face on Mars, the evidence to me seems to be coming in continually. Yeah, it's still a piece of rock on the surface of Mars. A few months after the Cydonia pictures are released, a series of setbacks befalls the search for life on Mars. The first occurs in December 1998, when NASA launches Mars Climate Orbiter. But when we got there with Mars Climate Orbiter, we came too close to the planet, and the spacecraft burned up. Then, on December 3, 1999, the full steam ahead Mars program is dealt a crushing blow. Mars Polar Lander, the first lander set to explore the ice at Mars' south pole, doesn't make it. When the legs unfolded and the rocket lit to slow the spacecraft down to a gentle landing, the computer software in the lander got a signal that said that we had already reached the ground. Unfortunately, we were well over 100 feet from the surface. The computer told the engines to shut off. We were on the surface, and it fell and crashed. Conspiracy theorists and mainstream scientists alike begin to talk about a kind of Martian Bermuda Triangle. More than half the probe sent to Mars since 1960 have failed. Russia has lost 16 out of 19. The U.S., four out of 12, including the $1.4 billion Mars Observer in 1993. Japan is 0 for 1. Their first and only probe, Nozomi, is currently out of its planned orbit, slingshotting around the sun, and may return to Mars, if they're lucky, in 2001. People talk of the great Martian ghoul or the great galactic ghoul, and even scientists use this terminology, but they don't mean it literally. They're the real Bermuda Triangle and the great real ghoul is us. We make mistakes. But that's the business that we're in. When you try to send robots to some far off place, when we can't even design a robot that'll vacuum your rug, uh, we're a daring people. And as Henry the Navigator would have said in 1450s, he said, we're gonna take losses along the way. Fortunately, most of our losses are little robots. When we continue, in the future, the search for life on Mars may very well begin with seeds from Earth. It is very clearly physically possible that our grandchildren will begin a project to change Mars, to bring it back alive. NASA has plans to send an unmanned probe to Mars every two years. The spaceship will search for the best spots to land robots and someday, possibly, astronauts. History's Mysteries will be back on the History Channel.